and thank you for um, inviting me to talk. So these are my disclosures. Um, I'm a speaker for Sanofi and Alexion. I've got research grants for Alexion on, um, uh, and um, KHK and Novartis and Amgen for denosumab and bisphosphonate. So you can't believe anything I say about them today, which is a little unfortunate. And I'm a consultant for Alexion and um, KHK. So one of the hardest things today is to work out what not to talk about as opposed to what to talk about. What you'll see on the slide here is there is nothing on burosumab and its management in XLH. For that, you'll have to come on Sunday. I'm going to be talking about burosumab in osteoporosis, growth hormone, and rosazozumab, sorry, romazozumab, which is extremely hard to say. We'll look at novel uses for anti-resorptors, for focal bone lesions, and then at the end, touch on hypophosphatasia and asphatase alpha. As we've heard, seeing the first part of this talk on osteoporosis, we've already heard very eloquently today what the causes of pediatric osteoporosis are, whether they're primary or secondary, and the importance of vertebral and long bone fractures. It's important, though, although we're here talking about medication, to think that medication is really the last thing you do when you're managing a child with osteoporosis. The first thing you have to do is try and maximise their physical activity. As we've heard, muscle is very important for bone reduce chronic inflammation, make sure they've got adequate calcium and vitamin D, look at pubertal progression, which is very important for bone development in children, minimise osteotoxic medication, ensure optimal growth, and currently the management is bisphosphonates if you're going to throw a medicine in. But what we're going to talk about today are other treatments. So first you're looking at anti-catabolic agents. So they're agents that reduce osteoclastic bone formation which is what bisphosphonates do. And the current one, the, the new one for that, is denosumab. So denosumab is a rank ligand inhibitor. So what's rank ligand? Rank ligand is a molecule produced by the osteoblast. Its job is to go to the prim uh, immature osteoclasts and turn them from baby osteoclasts into these nasty-looking adolescent osteoclasts that eat up bone. Rank ligand uh, inhibitors, denosumab, block the action of rank ligand and stop it getting it to its receptor rank. So what it does, it inhibits osteoclastic production. As opposed to bisphosphonates, their job is basically to poison osteoclasts once they're already made. There are limited data on denosumab use in children. In 2017, there were a total of 44 whole children reported in the literature who have been treated with denosumab, and most of them were osteogenesis imperfecta. And there are a smattering of other disorders such as fibrous dysplasia, juvenile Paget's disease, giant cell tumours of bone, aneurysmal bone system, we'll look at some of that a little later on, cerebral palsy and hypercalcemia. But what we'll do is... Um, I'll just talk uh, very quickly about uh, how, how denosumab may actually be too powerful a drug for its use in children. And this really comes down to its effects on mineral homeostasis. And that is when you first start using denosumab, what it does, it essentially wipes out all your osteoclasts. It's like bisphosphonates on steroids. And so what it does, it reduces osteoclastic bone resorption. When you first start using it, it can, it can lead to hypocalcemia. And then what happens, you stop using the denosumab and all the osteoclasts come racing back like you've just let them out of the pen. And they eat up all your bone and that can lead to rebound hypercalcemia. And the reason you get the rebound hypercalcemia is you get these sclerotic bands at the metaphyses, like you get uh, temporary osteopetrosis, and then when the osteoclasts come back, they eat up all the bone. So what about denosumab in osteogenesis imperfecta, where it's possibly been shown to be effective? So there are limited data, but in 10 patients with moderate severe OI who'd all been treated with bisphosphonates before, uh, they received denosumab, one milligram per kilogram subcutaneously every 12 weeks for 48 weeks. And what that showed is that bone density increased, but there was no change in vertebral shape and no change in mobility. So although bone density is an important way of uh, looking 
at the benefit of whatever medication you have on bone health. It's not the be all and end all, it's just another measure. And in children, in fact, something that's even more important than bone density is vertebral shape, mobility, quality of life and fracture. And there's been none of those data yet in children with denosumab. In children with uh, OI who have had previous bisphosphonate treatment, it's been shown to be relatively safe without that significant reduction in uh, calcium when you start, nor have they been shown to have the rebound hypercalcemia upon cessation. But it's important to remember here that the bone turnover in these children is already low because they've been soaked with bisphosphonates beforehand. The safety of the bisphosphonates has led to Amgen now starting, now running an international trial of the use of denosumab in osteogenesis imperfecta. So that's the new osteoclastic bone inhibitor. We've heard today though that it's bone formation that makes bone strong in children. And that leads us to thinking about are there ways of making bone bigger? Are there ways of increasing trabecular mass and bone size? And here we can turn to growth hormone, teriparatide, anti-sclerotin antibody and combination. So those of you who are lucky enough to be at the, at the uh, fellows school and were awake enough to remember my presentation there would have seen this before. So this is a cartoon of a bone that's got the diameter of 100% and another bone that's only 17% bigger. Both bits of bone have the same density, the same cortical area and the same mass. But simply because you've made that bone 17% bigger, what you've actually done is you've made it over 50% stronger. So to make bones strong, they don't need to be heavy. They need to be big. And so how do we make bones big? There are, there's one study that's very beneficial of growth hormone in children. So growth is the best way that we can make bones stronger and bigger. So here's a combination study. It's a randomized control trial of a bisphosphonate plus growth hormone in children with osteogenesis imperfecta. But please note, most of them had mild OI, 18 of them. And it was shown that in the combination therapy, there was greater bone mineral density and bone area after 12 months. But that was only seen in children who grew. So only seen in mild OI, not in the moderately severe OI. And remember that, because we're going to look at some mouse studies soon, which showed very similar data. Right, so now we're looking at ways of manipulating the bone cell to produce, or the osteoblast to produce more bone. You can look at it in adults, there's teriparatide, where they use PDH, and calcinolytics. But we don't use them in children because if you're a mouse and you get given PDH, you develop an osteosarcoma. So there's a black box warning in teriparatide not to be used in children. But what about manipulating the Wnt beta catenin system? So what happens, Wnt binds to LRP5 and Frizzle to activate beta catenin. Beta catenin goes down to the nucleus of the osteoblast and says, make bone. The osteocyte, which sits in bone, so osteocytes sit in bone and they hold hands and they communicate with each other and they control everything. They, tell, they sense strain and they're like the mechano sensors within bone. So if you're an osteocyte and you're sitting in bone and you're really, really happy, you think that life is great, I couldn't be happier, we don't need to make more bone, what you do is that you make this stuff called DKK and sclerostin. And what it does, it binds and interrupts the association between LRP5 and frizzled and wint and that turns off bone production. Radio. Now, what we've got is we've got antibodies to sclerostin. And so what sclerostin does, it binds, a uh, sclerostin antibody binds to sclerostin and makes the bone believe it's under strain. So it makes the, uh, the bone think that the child's running around, the bone's bending, I need to make more bone to stop my bone from breaking. And that's romazozumab. There are no pediatric romazozumab data. So the data is on adults. And what this is, this is an early study. 
that's comparing romazozumab, alendronate, teriparatide, and nothing. The romazozumab is green, alendronate blue, teriparatide, or PDH, is sort of that other colour. And what it shows is that if you give romazozumab, you get a transient increase in bone formation and a reduction in bone resorption. But quite excitingly, what you see is you get much more significant and sustained improvement in bone density at lumbar spine, total hip and femoral neck over 12 months, superior to everything else. But what's been shown subsequent to that is that if you give romazozumab and then freeze the bone that you make with either a bisphosphonate or denosumab, that's a much better effect than giving romazozumab alone. So this is where combination therapy comes in. You give an anabolic agent to make bone, you give an anti-catabolic to freeze the bone you make. So the closest we can get to children are mice. There's data in immobility and osteogenesis imperfecta. Children who are non-ambulant with cerebral palsy have elevated levels of this hormone, sclerostin. So it makes sense that they could be a target for anti-sclerostin antibody. If you get a mouse and you hold it by the tail or you get a medical student to hold it by the tail for 14 days so it doesn't walk, what you find is you get resorption of trabecular bone and you get decreased cortical bone. But if you have that same mouse and it doesn't make sclerostin, then what you see is you get preservation of the trabecular bone and preservation of your cortical bone. What if you have a mouse with mild OI and you give it anti-sclerostin antibody? What you find is that you preserve, so this is wild type and this is the OI mouse treated with uh, anti-sclerostin antibody. You get preservation of cortical thickness and cortical area, but most importantly, the bone strength is also maintained in the OI mouse. That's a mild OI mouse. Remember, growth hormone was beneficial in the mild mouse, but not in the severe mouse. What if you give this anabolic agent to a moderately severe OI mouse? Well, nothing happens. You can imagine how excited the researchers were to find that they can give romazozumab to a, a severe mouse, but nothing happens. What we did, we took the same mouse, though, and we combined it with anti-sclerostin antibody and a bisphosphonate, so combination therapy. And we actually found that we returned the OI mouse with a combination of therapy to the same strength as a wild-type mouse. So it might be that you need to combine the two. What about denosumab in focal bone lesions? At our hospital, we do a lot of stuff to try and look at novel ways to use uh, medication in children with bone disorders. So in children with uh, focal bone diseases, I'm going to concentrate on aneurysmal bone cysts and giant cell tumours. Aneurysmal bone cysts and giant cell tumours are fairly rare bone tumours in children, uh, but the standard treatment is surgery and they come back frequently. As, whoa, interesting. So just imagine there's something written here because I can see it here, but you can't see it there. What that's going to show you, I don't know, what that's going to show you here is that's going to say that the stromal cell is the primary tumoral cell in children with these giant cell tumours. What these stromal cells produce is rank ligand. What the rank ligand does is it attracts these really big mega osteoclasts called giant cells and then what that does is that chews up the bone which is very similar to osteoblasts producing rank ligand, activating osteoclasts and leading to normal bone resorption. Are you all imagining that? Imagine. Ah, see I told you it was there. That is weird. Okay, anyway, so stromal cells, giant cells, osteoclastic bone resorption and osteolytic bone tumours. So if you use denosumab, you're going to stop the progression of the tumour. So this is a case that we've got of a boy with uh, a giant cell tumour. His 10-year-old boy, he had an IL-10 receptor deficiency, which meant he made lots of osteoclasts. He developed a giant cell tumour in his maxilla. We treated him with denosumab for eight weeks, and then we thought, we'll do a bone marrow transplant. We're going to cure him of everything because we're so clever. The bone marrow transplant didn't work. The giant cell tumour came back. We gave him more denosumab. And this is showing how he had his giant cell tumour in his maxilla with disrupted dentition in November 2014. Denosumab, the tumour melts away, the dentition 
came back. So it works incredibly effectively. What about an aneurysmal bone cyst? Well, a 12-year-old boy with neck pain, pathological fracture, surgery, at risk of tetraplegia. We gave him denosumab in high doses and it reduced the tumour, no activity on PET scan and led to bone formation in his vertebra. And this is how you can see that here, his aneurysmal bone cyst in his neck and after some denosumab, the tumour goes away. So very effective for focal bone lesions that are otherwise inoperable. But you can see our children also develop hypercalcemia at an alarming rate with the sclerotic bands. So really, is it safe enough to use in children who don't have these life-threatening conditions or at risk of tetraplegia? That's what we need to work out. Because there's other complications. The, the boy in case two who had the, the aneurysmal bone cyst actually developed uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw with this sequestrum in his, in his jaw, a bit of sequestered bone. Thankfully, once that bone was removed, the jaws healed up. So these drugs are very powerful, but they have their side effects. So summary, intravenous bisphosphonates remain the primary treatment. Uh, intravenous bisphosphonates for moderately severe and maybe oral bisphosphonates for less severe. Anti-resorptive medications, are they better than bisphosphonates? and can they be used in growing children safely. Anabolic agents increase bone size in, in adults and in uh, animals. Combination therapy, I think, is the way to go in moderately severe disease. Um, and medical therapy for focal bone lesions shows promise. So very quickly, turning on to hypophosphatasia. And I'll start with a case. It's a bit of a sad case, so don't get too upset. A female infant, non-cosanguinous European-Australian parents, born at 39 weeks, 10th centile for birth weight, developed seizures at day three and severe dis respiratory distress at day three. The child had the typical biochemistry of severe hypophosphatasia with hypercalcemia, very low alkaline phosphatase and elevated phosphoethanolamine. X-rays showed the pathognomonic changes of the uh, tongues of poor mineralization going into the metaphysis of the long bones, very poor mineralization of the ribs as they join the vertebra. As commonly happens in severe hypophosphatasia or infantile hypophosphatasia, the child died of respiratory failure at day 34. So hypophosphatasia is due to mutations in the TNSALP gene and it can either be dominant or recessive, which leads to low alkaline phosphatase levels, accumulation of these substrates, I'll show you in a little while, and that leads to the skeletal and extraskeletal manifestations. So in the bone, uh, TNSALP um, hydrolyzes uh, uh, inorganic phosphate, and then that uh, low levels of TNSALP in osteoblast membrane uh, leads to extracellular accumulation of inorganic uh, pyrophosphates, which is an inhibitor of bone mineralization. So that's why you get the bone changes in hypophosphatasia. But you also get uh, vitamin B6 dependent seizures. And that's because for B6 to get into the brain, it needs uh, TNS ALP uh, to dephosphorylate, and then it goes into the brain and then gets rephosphorylated into vitamin B6. So if you're lacking TNSALP, you get low levels of vitamin B6 in the brain and you have seizures. There are five major types of hypophosphatasia, perinatal and infantile that un are onset less than six months of age, the juvenile, which is onset less than 18 years of age, the adult, over 18 years of age, and odontohypophosphatasia, where the only manifestation you see is in the teeth. Asphatase alpha is made up of recombinant TNSALP attached to human IgG, but then has this very important 10L aspartate residue, which is the bit that attracts it to the bone. And it's either given subcutaneously daily or second daily. These are the initial reports of uh, 10 children with perinatal or infantile hypophosphatasia. And you can see over a 48-week period, there was 
impressive, some would say almost miraculous healing of the bone disease of these children, as exemplified in these radiographs. There was also improved respiratory function with improvement of uh, rib mineralisation. There was improvement in developmental milestones, but during treatment one child died of sepsis. More recently, there's been data looking at the seven-year outcome of these children. And what it's shown is there's improved rickets. So in this score here, this is a, a, looks at the change in rickets. So as you go from zero to one, it means your rickets is getting a little bit better. Zero to two, a whole lot better. Zero to three, much, much, much better, if you like. Over a seven-year period, there was sustained improvement in the bone mineralisation of these children. And here, the rickets severity score, the idea is it goes from 10, which is really bad, to zero, which is no rickets at all. And you see, over 10 years, there was a rapid improvement over the first year, and then that was maintained out to seven years. And this is exemplified by these x-rays here. Baseline to seven years. Respiratory failure is a common cause of death in severe osteo, uh, sorry, what are we talking about? Hypophosphatasia. And here, 11, uh, 10 of the 11 children required some respiratory support within the first 12 months of life. But after seven years of those children who die, who, who, who survived, none of them were having, requiring respiratory support. What about gross motor function? We're paediatricians, it's function that matters to us. It's not x-rays or bone density. You can see that there's sustained improvement over three years. This is a different study, a little earlier of the same cohort, but there was improvement in gross motor, fine motor, and cognitive function over a four-year period. Asphatase alpha improves overall survival. At five years, the survival rate from historical controls of children with severe hypophosphatasia was 27%. Treated with asphatase alpha, that survival was increased to 82%. So in summary, hypophosphatasia and asphatase alpha heals bone mineralization defect, enables weaning off ventilatory support, improves gross motor and cognitive function, and improves survival. But there's a catch. It costs $102 per milligram. So for a, a young child, it's going to cost about three quarters of a million US dollars per year to treat. And for a larger child with childhood hypophosphatasia, although even though it's not a fatal disorder, it's a very debilitating disorder, it will cost you almost two and a half million dollars per year to treat. This has led to it not receiving registration in Australia because it was felt to be too expensive by the government. But it's available in Europe and also available in the United States. I work with some wonderful people, both in Sydney, but also in Melbourne, and Margaret Zacharin's one of those, also all throughout Australia. And then there's people who tried to teach me something about bone, especially Frank Rauch and Nick Bishop and Leanne Ward. I'd like to thank them all for their assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, for your usual wonderful lecture. Uh, was there time for a couple of questions? As well.
that's a that's a great question. Um, so alkaline phosphatase levels, as we know, vary with age. They're higher in children than they are in adults, uh, and that's due to growth. Um, in our lab, it's blue is good, red is bad um, for a result, and our lab has red results when they're low or when they're high. But then you've got to have people appreciate, try and appreciate what that means. And you're right, hypophosphatasia is, is a very, one of the more severe reasons you can have it. Uh, prolonged glucocorticoid use, so boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy nearly always have a low alkaline phosphatase. Uh, things like malnutrition, zinc deficiency, there's a number of causes for low alkaline phosphatase. Uh, but it's important to try and just raise with your labs uh, and raise also with um, your paediatricians as to the importance of a low alkaline phosphatase. I think what that speaks to a lot as well is, is continuing to have paediatric specific laboratories who do realise the importance of this uh, disorder. Any other questions? In, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Familiar jaw tumors with hypothyroidism entity. Yeah. So, has it been used for those jaw uh, there's, there's, no, there's no reports of it. This is one of those cases where I've never seen it, but you guys have probably seen 58,000 cases. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you an, uh, an educated answer to that. Okay, if there's no more questions, thank you, Craig. Uh, and uh, this, this is, that's, the, that's the end of the academic program for today and Sabrata will tell us about the cultural program.